Last time on Building Resilience, we put Veriform siding on the wall and panel and channel cladding and open joint cladding. Another cladding you've seen from us quite a bit is the open joint cladding. This is a PVC deck board that we put over Benjamin Obdike's Invisirap uh, UV and their Batten UV product, and it's a really great system. We love it quite a bit. Something you haven't seen as much from us would be vinyl siding. This is Veriform from Plygem, and it's a pretty impressive vinyl siding. It's much more rigid than a traditional vinyl siding. It's hurricane resistant, looks pretty sharp. And we start it with a J-channel over here, then travels along and it meets another Plygem product. This is their cellular PVC trim, which we love for all the same reasons we love PVC panel. It's durable, it tanks paint well, it's very easy to use. This comes pre-rabbited so that the vinyl siding tucks in behind it very nicely and gives really crisp lines and it looks pretty sharp. We decided to dress this one up with a stool and apron detail. Uh, which hides the transition between the materials. And then over here on their corner, they've done something that I also like, which is to build up this front edge. It adds a little bit of, of stiffness and resilience to the corner and provides uh, the other receiving side of our vinyl siding as it dies away. This time, we're gonna talk about mini split heat pumps. When we talk about heat pumps, we aren't always talking about mini splits. But when we talk about mini splits, we are always talking about heat pumps. Mini splits are like room-sized heating and cooling systems that can extract heat energy from the air. Traditional heat pumps are less efficient as temperatures drop into the 40s and 30s, so heat pump adoption in the north has not been the smoothest of roads. Heat pump adoption up here in the north has not been the smoothest of, of roads. In fact, 20 years ago, we weren't allowed to use them as a primary heat source. And frankly, the technology just wasn't there yet. But a lot has changed since then, and now they're an option worth considering, especially with things like hyperheat from Mitsubishi, which can comfortably perform down to minus 20 degrees. And when it's not freezing cold out, boasts a pretty impressive efficiency of 4.68 COP, which is like saying 468% efficient. And when it does get down to zero or minus five or minus 20, that might drop down to say, 1.6, 1, which is like saying 100%, or even maybe as low as 70%. But you compare that against a traditional furnace or boiler that's running 96, 97% efficiency at its peak performance, and that's still a pretty good deal. And that's why we're replacing this old unit with a newer, more efficient one. This 15-year-old unit is much less efficient than the new mini splits. When we talk about mini splits, for most folks, what they envision they're largely viewed as obstacles or unattractive. Um, but there are a couple of heat pump mini splits on the market now, like this one from Mitsubishi, that do a great job of concealing themselves so that you don't even know that they're there. This is a ceiling cassette. So this one nests nicely up into the ceiling, and the only thing that will be visible when it's done is a nice white grill in this case, which will blend in with the drywall. Where do we put these things? Uh, we generally locate them on or near exterior walls because the exterior wall is the one that's subject to the most temperature change from outside. And we wanna use the warm air to wash across the glass to help minimize condensation. The nice thing about these units being supply on the ceiling or high on the wall is that that air moves across the room and gives a good balanced wash to the entire space. Now the condenser unit, where do we locate that? That's easy. You put it outside the house. Duh. My favorite place uh, and way to install the condenser is to use the wall mounting brackets so that I can mount it to the side of the house. It's well off the ground, three or four feet off the ground. Um, there's good airflow all the way around the unit and any snow accumulation and then also the ice that comes off the units is not gonna be anywhere near the unit. These things produce a lot of water when you run them in the winter and that water quickly becomes ice. And we want to make sure that, you know, we're going to have a four to six inch thick sheet of ice that's going to build up wherever the drain is. And we want to think about where we want that ice to be. So we're putting this condenser unit outside toward the back where nobody will be walking in the winter and off the ground in case there's ever any snow in Minneapolis. The indoor and outdoor units are connected with four lifelines two refrigerant lines, a condensation line, and an electrical cable. You can attach the electrical line to the indoor unit before you mount it to the wall or after. Either way, 
Mounting it to the wall involves precisely locating the mounting bracket and drilling a big hole in the wall. Another innovation that we saw from Mitsubishi with these ceiling cassettes has to do with how the line set connects to the unit. Now typically when a mini split is going to have a failure, it's where the line set meets the ceiling cassette and you have to chip out a bunch of drywall to get to it. But what they did is they made their cover a little bit larger. So you can see that instead of the cover ending here, this is our drywall template, it comes all the way out to about where these wooden blocks are. And that means that if there's an issue with the unit and they have to service it, you can pop the cover off and access the line set without doing any damage. Let's go inside and see how that wall unit is shaping up. With the bracket mounted, Aaron pokes the refrigerant and condensation line stubs through the hole in the wall. He feeds the electrical cable through the box and sets the mini split head onto the bracket. The air filters are fitted with air cleaning pads to remove allergens and the front panel is clipped into place and closed. Outside, we've still got those four lifelines. He'll connect the condensate line first with a coupling and a hose clamp. At the bottom, it feeds into a line that runs into the perimeter drain. To make the refrigerant line connections, Craig breaks out his flaring tool. The lines are attached with compression fittings and tightened with a torque wrench. With everything connected to the indoor unit, he coaxes the lines into the plastic conduit track and fastens it all together with zip ties. Now they get the outdoor unit ready. Craig is removing the compression fittings to flare out the refrigerant tubing while Aaron double checks that the compressor will fit on the stand that he just set up. In theory, the numbers check out. And they check out in reality too. The compressor is bolted to the stand and they attach the other end of the lines. First, he cuts the tubes to the correct length and then flares the ends. Spreading a little refrigerant oil on the tubing end helps make a tight seal. Again, the compression fitting is torqued tight, and they test the system for leaks. The system's pressurized to 600 PSI with nitrogen for 24 hours to ensure there are no leaks. Then, a vacuum pump evacuates the lines and removes any moisture before refrigerant is released into the system. After charging the system with refrigerant, they cover the lines for a tidy installation and see if the system works. Looks like it does. With everything working fine, they put the cover panel in place and head home. Next time, we're gonna jump back up on the roof and lay down some standing seam metal roofing from ABC. We'll clip it in, screw it down, and fit the parts together, just like the pros do on Building Resilience.